Hello, my name is Allison. I'm a librarian here at the Genealogy Center, and I'm very happy that you guys are here. Happy Halloween! <laughs> so Halloween was the inspiration behind the topic for today. So I will tell you that we are kind of going on a tour of a little bit of darkness with the death and sorrow, um, but I did give you some resources. Uh, they're a little bit generalized, and we'll go through them a little bit, but this is mostly, mostly for entertainment and education. So let's go ahead and get started. So tragedies in times of sorrow. Everybody has a tragedy or two in their families. Now they can be major or minor. What do you guys think of when you think of tragedies? Death, what else? Yep, accidents. Anything else? Illness, yep. Mm hmm What about minor? What's, what would a minor tragedy be? Divorce. I actually included that. So this is kind of a brief overview of some types of tragedies. Now, I just tried to pick a few that might be of interest. Um, now, when we find one of these tragedies in our family trees, a lot of times that can make us take a step back and maybe even sometimes wash our hands of the entire affair. Because we're like, oh, I don't even know what to do with this. We're done. We can take a step back. That's fine. But it's still your family tree. It's still your family. So understanding and doing your research is still OK. But you have to try and remember, you are not your ancestors. OK. So fun fact, you're going to hear that multiple times. I want to make sure that's the biggest thing that you take away. You are not your ancestors. So many things that seem like tragedies to us may not always be tragedies to them. Or what could have been tragedies to them may not be tragedies to us. So these are the types that we're just going to go over today. We're going to talk about some of the things we talked about with death. What about criminal activity? That could be rather shocking. Divorce. You know, in a lot of places, you don't really think that people were getting divorced in the 1800s. That can actually make you take a step back. Slavery. That can really upset people. I have seen people really upset. There's also family not related. Has anybody in here done a DNA test? Quite a few of you. So a lot of people are doing DNA and finding out that there may be family members that aren't actually related to them. Or they're finding out that there was an adoption back further in their family tree that they knew nothing about. And that can be very shocking. Um, mental illness. That can be pretty shocking to come across. And poverty. I included that one because sometimes people are like, no, my family didn't live in a poor house. No, we were, they were always, we're, we're fine, we're middle class. And it's like, well, you are now. So you kind of have to just, OK, you are not your ancestors. You are doing the research. You've come from them, but you are not your ancestors. So with death, let's go through some of these different accidents. So has anybody seen this picture before? <laughs> One person. <laughs> has anybody else? This is the McBride family. So the McBride family, they actually lived in Allen County. And they, Mr. and Mrs. Marion McBride and their nine children were in a car, and they were crossing a railroad track, and a train, the car stalled, and a train came and hit them. And every single one of them died, including an unborn child. So this is actually the funeral of the McBride family. So this is an accident that actually happened nearby. 
Now, one of the interesting things, and I wanted to show you guys this. Let's see if this will let me do it. There we go. Can you guys see my screen at all? Rot row. So one of the things that you guys can do is look in coroner's reports. So if you have never looked at a coroner report, there we go. They are pretty interesting. Now for Allen County, they have been, here we go, beautiful. Genealogycenter.org. Um, if you go to our website, you can find for Allen County, there is a database of them. So if you go to Allen County, Indiana Resources, and then scroll down, and there's the database for the coroner's records. So you can actually put in for McBride and take a look. And it actually tells you, okay, they died at the railroad track. And then it goes through and actually tells you what they died from, which is pretty sad. But it is helpful when you're doing this type of research to have this bit of information. Has anyone ever looked at a coroner's report for any of their family members? No? Okay, so it, you have? Okay, you have. So this could be a, a new idea, right? If you've had an accident in your family and you haven't found any information on them or it's been just little bits and pieces. Now, I give you some ideas later. If you look down, I group them all together under the resources for death. But look at the local repositories to see if there's a database such as this. And then you'll have to go to the coroner's office to start requesting information like this. Now, I'm trying to be very general because not everybody's family is from Allen County. Not everybody has family even in Indiana. So we're trying to be as general as possible and still giving you guys ideas for resources. So where else would you look for information on accidents? Newspapers. Exactly. So a couple of the newspaper options that you have here are newspapers.com or newspaper archive. And I say here is in Allen County Public Library System. Any of the libraries, you can access those. Um, Chronicling America is on your list. That is something that you can access from home. Has anybody ever seen that before? Chronicling America. So Chronicle in America, if I can spell, is done by the Library of Congress. So there's newspapers from all across the country. And these are free. I did, however, give you the link for this, so you should be able to access this from home. The other one that a lot of people don't remember or even know about is that there's a, new, a Google newspaper archive. Has anybody ever found that before? A lot of them are historic newspapers. And they're free online. You can access them from home. So make sure to also go to the link I gave you there as well. And then you can also try, if you're not finding what you're looking for because of copyright issues or the fact that they haven't been put on any of the databases that you've been utilizing to do research, what you want to do is actually go to the different historical societies, the libraries, the archives, for that state that you're researching in. And sometimes it's universities. Occasionally, they're housed at a university with a microfilm. And that's what you're probably going to have to be looking at is microfilm for those. So depending on where you're researching is depending on what the resources are. So let's go back to this. So the McBrides are pretty sad. And the thing is, and this is the part that kills me, is there is question to whether or not um, 
Mr. McBride actually drove out into the tracks on purpose. So when you're looking into these, read into everything. They don't know for sure. They just know they stopped and bought candy for the children, and then they all died because they had just stopped at a gas station. So it's a horrible tragedy, and it's unfortunate. The next one is Mr. George Hill and Mr. Peter Masterson. So these gentlemen are kind of interesting. Um, so they were actually working, um, Mr. Hill was a mason, and they were working on a building at the corner of Maine and Harrison, and the scaffolding. Actually, the hook came undone, and both men fell. Now, Mr. Hill did pass away, and Mr. Masterson survived, but had quite a few injuries, if you can understand. <laughs> but with this, and I'm just showing an example up here, because I will tell you, I tried to put some of these on the PowerPoint, but they got so squished, you couldn't even read them. So what I thought I would do instead is pass them around. I didn't think I should kill a tree for every one of these, because I doubt you all care to have a copy of every newspaper article. But if you want to take a look, this is the type of information that you can get when you are looking up these gentlemen. Let's say you have somebody who did die, and there would be a little newspaper article like this. And then there's the Denzer family. So this one's kind of interesting. Um, this is, I put it as an accident, but it also falls into all the other categories as well. So I just decided to start off with this because it was really sad. Um, the gentleman actually killed his daughter and then killed um, the husband the son-in-law, the husband of the daughter, and he, it, he just basically had a, a fit of rage. And they were trying to actually get away at certain points. Um, and then he shot himself in the mouth. So you have people who go through issues and you try to figure out, okay, why would they actually do this? Why would you, why would you harm other people? Well, that's when you want to start exploring those different articles. That's when you want to start looking at newspapers.com. There we go. Has anybody ever had a family member, if you want to share, anybody ever had a family member that had an issue like this? There was an accident, there was a murder. You had a car accident? Were you able to find newspaper articles on it? I was just trying to find places and trying to see. I couldn't find anything. What time period? I don't remember the exact year, but it was my cousin, and I was in middle school, and after junior high. So what time period would that be? Like 67, 68, I think. OK. So that time period is usually under copyright. So it's really hard to find newspaper articles from that time period. Have you found the death certificate? There you go, that's what you need to start with, so you can get a date. Once you get that date, then you can start trying to get the newspaper. Where was it? Here, Fort Wayne. Huzzah! <laughs> <laughs> so you guys see how once you try to come up with an idea, okay, so you know this happened, try to find the date, and then you can dig through newspapers. So newspapers.com, it says through 2018. Well, yeah, they do have some, but a lot of them are restricted by those copyright. Let's move on, and we're going to specifically go to this one. Now, the very first young man is actually in that picture below. And see, these break my heart. I don't understand them quite as, well, I, I'm a very sensitive soul, so any sort of hurt really bothers me. <laughs> I will be the first one to admit that. But 
if you have one of these in your family, it can be incredibly hard to talk about. Your family members may close off about discussing it. You may not have even known about it until you were doing research and came across it. And that's okay. So this gentleman, unfortunately, um, he was only 19 and he decided he could not live anymore and actually committed suicide by hanging. Now what's interesting, and this was probably the most interesting thing that happened while I was doing research, is if you go on Ancestry, and I just wanted to see what would happen. Oh, we're not doing that. We're going to this. Um, I wanted to see what would happen if I searched suicide, because I had some very specific things I was looking for. And you know, without having names, it's a little bit harder to find death certificates. I'm sure you guys know that. <laughs> So one of the things that I did was I actually searched for suicide and I found out that Vermont has this massive collection of death records and you can actually find suicide by that. So this is where this young man was from. Um, I found his name to be interesting. But if you go over here and you're actually searching, you can very specifically search for death, burial, cemetery, and obituaries making sure you guys can all see. Now, because of what I was doing, I just put in down here without a name, which most of you guys are not gonna be doing. But because I was looking for something specific, I started to go through these. And it just absolutely astounded me, A, that Vermont has them organized this way, and B, how many there were. I was very depressed after going through this. It was. It was very interesting. Also, some people's names are coming up as suicide, which was a whole nother ballgame of me going, say what? So, if you're looking for something very specific like this, make sure you have a name or at least an approximate name because the keyword is not gonna always work because if you're looking for something in Indiana, I will tell you, if you use keyword suicide Indiana, nothing will come up and you all most of you probably know Indiana death records are on Ancestry for the most part. So having that knowledge might actually help you with your search. The keyword does not work for cause of death when searching Indiana death records. Something new. Okay, so let's go back. So then there's Mr. Herman D. Adders. He was an interesting one to look up because his death certificate was probably one of the darkest I've ever seen. <laughs> um, normally they have a spot on death certificates where they can circle um, suicide, homicide, or accident. And the spot where that is is actually pretty much darkened out. But it very clearly says gunshot wound through head. And upon some further research, found that yes, that, that is what that was coming around to be is suicide, unfortunately. But sometimes the death certificates are just so hard to read that you have to continue to do research. You have to use, utilize the newspapers. You have to go after the coroner's reports. I'm gonna send these two around. And then the third one just absolutely astounded me. <laughs> this is from 1897. There was something called a woman's suicide club. And these people were committing suicide out in the street. Um, and I just absolutely could not fathom. And she took carbolic acid in front of hundreds of people out on the street. And it took her over an hour to die on the street. I was like, that is horrific. Why would you do that? She had her reasoning, but there were article after article about the suicide club and about what she was doing. And I was just, 
I still couldn't wrap my mind around it. And honestly, if you want to keep reading into it, it's one of those things that's just like, oh my goodness, why? Why is the, okay. But these things happen. People can't handle whatever's going on in their life anymore. People maybe are going to one of my later slides. Maybe there's mental illness. Maybe there's something going on in their world that you don't know about. And that's what you need to research. That's what you need to look into. OK, these two absolutely made my stomach sick. But we're going to talk about them. So anybody heard of Sylvia Likens? No? Oh, my Lanta. This poor child, she's the young woman. Um, she actually passed away in October of 1965. And I honestly want you all to remember her name because she completely deserves to have her name remembered. She was 16 years old. She died on October 26, 1965. Her parents um, actually worked and traveled quite a bit. Um, so they were carnival workers. And so they put their children, they, they had two children that they put in the care of this woman and her children. And this woman's name was Gertrude, and then I can't, I'm going to butcher her name. Um, it's Banna Zavsky. They tortured this child. They tortured her to death. Thankfully, they all went to prison for quite some time, but it wasn't just this woman. When I say they, it was this woman, her children, going all the way down to the age of 15, and some few years younger, and neighbor children. And at a certain point, she charged admission to watch the torture of this poor child. I cannot imagine. She, her sister was in this house and was told that if she tried to help her sister, that she would receive the same treatment. So she was afraid afraid to get help. She feared for her own life and her own safety and didn't know what to do. But she actually got out. They were caught, they were sentenced, and her poor sister did end up living a life and was able to get married and have children. So this is actually part of somebody's family history. This is part of who somebody is related to, happened to this poor girl. And the woman who tortured this child, her children pretty much all were set free at a certain point and married and had children. So this happens. People do have this in their family trees, and it is awful, but you are not your ancestors. It's something to keep remembering. You are not your ancestors. But I did want to bring this up just because this poor child needs to be remembered. Yeah. yeah. That family that tortured her, is that Fort Wayne area? No, Indianapolis. Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. Um, and I will tell you, there are newspaper articles. There are um, all sorts of different things. This actually, um, let me find out where it, what it was. This is the basis of Jack Ketchum's novel, The Girl Next Door. So it, it's a lot of different people have actually written about it, um, turned it into different stories, but it's just heartbreaking. So the other um, lady in this picture, Helen, she was also murdered, and again, in Indianapolis. Now this one, this one was really interesting. Um, she was a doctor. She was a doctor during a time period when women were typically not doctors. 
Um, so this is early 1900s. So she was actually, this is terrible, but she was murdered and she was found with her hands closed. No one was in the room. The door was locked, the windows were closed, and her throat was cut. And they thought that she had committed suicide. And that was the initial finding. And then they realized that it was murder. So then they continued to investigate. And they started accusing people. And she was secretly engaged to a gentleman named Dr. Craig. And then there was another man who was also, he was an executor of her estate, um, Alonzo Ragsdale, that was also indicated in her murder. And because of the lack of evidence, nobody was actually charged. Nobody went to prison for her murder. So at this point, this woman is still, her murder has not been solved. And I will tell you, just because it's Halloween, the place on Delaware in Indianapolis where she was murdered is considered to be haunted. Her spirit still keeps coming back looking for her murderer to get justice. At least that's what the stories are. <laughs> so whether or not you want to believe that, that's up to you. But I had to throw a little bit of Halloween spirit in. Oh, uh, 1913. And then we talked about illness. So illness is something else. Now, one of the things that I find really interesting about illness is, have you guys ever gotten a death certificate and went, what in the world is this cause of death? What's the first course of action? Look it up. Look it up. Where do you look it up? Medical books. Medical books? Google? So a lot of people do use search engines. Um, at a certain point, when you start looking up the really archaic medical terms, they, they don't always pop up. Um, one of the, my favorite that I found is someone flooded to death. A few of you have probably heard that. I've talked about it before. But um, she flooded to death in childbirth. She bled to death. But her death certificate literally just said flooded. Nothing else. And I was like, what does this mean? Can we find this out? <laughs> it meant she bled to death in a miscarriage. So sometimes you have to look up these terms and figure out what they are. But it's also interesting to look at the different causes of death in the time period. So some things have been eradicated. Some things have longer lifespans. So the first gentleman, Larry Omar Abdair, he actually died because of influenza. That's not exactly a common way to die anymore, is it? But if you can see, his tombstone's up there with his parents. Can anybody see the date? He died in 1955. 1955 from influenza. That's actually not that long ago. So it, you kind of have to take a step back and realize that people are still dying in more recent days of diseases that we think, or illnesses, we think that, oh, they just have the flu, they'll be fine in a few days. People are still dying of these. So you have to take a step back from that. Um, the next person was Esther Adelman. She was, oh, she was another baby. So she was only 15. You can see her tiny little tombstone there. Um, she had a brain tumor. And they only knew about it for five weeks. They found out, and there was nothing they could do. Now, this would be something that a lot of people wouldn't talk about, because this would be really hard to lose a child, especially after not knowing that they were even ill for such a short period of time. The last one is Mikey, Mike Hillman. He died. He died because his lungs actually quit working, but it was because of muscular dystrophy. So he was one of the early people to actually be diagnosed with muscular dystrophy up in Chicago. Um, and he died in 1964 at the age of 15. 
So he was one of the first kids that actually worked with Jerry Lewis and the Muscular Dystrophy Association, which had just been founded. Um, prior to that, it, they really didn't know what was going on. It was a very, very unknown disease. It was rare. Now, somebody who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, like he, he did, they have a life expectancy of around 21, 22 years old, which is much longer than that 15 years that he got. So it's very interesting to look at these and see how medicine has changed over time. So when you're looking at these death certificates and finding these deaths, it's also very important to look at the history, history of the illnesses, history of what was going on. You never know what you will find. Now I keep talking about all these lovely resources because I feel like it's good to kind of intermingle them in, but I did put them in one lump area for you. Um, so a couple things, um, we talked about death certificates, newspapers, coroner reports. You wanna look at court records because if it is a murder or even a suicide sometimes, there can be an investigation. So that could be something that ends up in the court. You wanna look at funeral home records if they're available. Cemetery records if you can get your hands on them. I know not all cemeteries have offices. If it's long enough ago and the office closed, the cemetery is not, is just being run by the township. Maybe you go to the township. Maybe you look at local repositories to see if they got the records. And then you wanna look up those medical terms. So, this little database, oh, yes. This little database is fun to use. I don't know if anybody has ever seen this before. It's archaicmedicalterms.com. You can do a search for any weird term, and it brings up results. And if you look at that very top one with flooding, it actually tells you exactly what it is, and it's accurate. Very first result. So make sure you look these things up, see what you can find. Also, if you can't read every bit of the cause of death, start to do a search engine search for it. I'll say Google, but you can also use Bing or anything else. Um, start to do a Google search for it and see if it comes up close enough. Because even if you spell it wrong, eventually the right term will come up and you'll go, oh yeah, that is what that is. That, that is how that's spelled. I'm just missing a letter. So make sure you do some searches. And make sure you understand what was going on in their lives prior to their death. So if it was a suicide, okay, what was actually happening? If it was murder, what was actually happening? If they were ill, what was happening around them? Was it an epidemic? Was it something that was passed down through their family? You have to really think about these things and try to figure out a little bit more before you kind of dig in. So every time I say family history, <laughs> make sure you're looking into their parents and their siblings and what's going on with them too, okay? because I say that a few times. Family history, that's all of them. Okay, remember what I said? Exactly, you are not your ancestors. Okay, so this fellow, anybody heard of him? No? Oh man, okay, so he was actually the leader of the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana. Um, he went to prison for murder because he was a terrible person. And the person he murdered was a young white woman. Um, he basically, he murdered her. It was ugly. It was terrible. Poor girl. And he went to prison, but this man was married four times. And he had a daughter. Do you see his daughter at the very bottom there? and she married. So this is her family. Her father went to prison for murdering somebody. 
and for being, he was a leader of the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana. So he thought he had, he thought that, and he's actually been quoted as saying something similar, but he thought that he was the law in Indiana and that nobody could get him. So this man's child had to live with that. Now, she, changed, she changes her name periodically, and I don't really blame her. Um, she was also out in Oklahoma. Um, this gentleman was born in Texas, lived in Oklahoma, then came to Indiana. Um, so this child, Florence, she actually even changed her name from Florence. She went by her middle name, Catherine. She didn't even want to go by that name because it was in the newspapers that her name was Florence Stevenson. So it's kind of interesting to look at that. And I find it interesting, um, in Michigan City in 1927, um, he, was no, he was denied release to testify because um, his ex-wife was asking for su child support for their daughter. And it lists her name. And this was in the newspaper. So even if you do find criminal activity in your family, you are not your ancestors. Now, where would we look for information on criminal activity? Well, newspapers, like the one I'm passing around. You can find a lot of information. Because any sort of criminal event, what happens if something happens around here? It ends up in the newspaper, right? Well, it did then, too. The bigger the crime, the more times it's in different papers, and the more sensational, the more newspapers it is in across the state or country. So you might find a lot of information, or you might find just little bits um, about maybe an uncle or a great-grandfather who went on a bender and got arrested for a public intoxication. You know, you can find stuff like that. <laughs> Court records are also really nice. You can utilize these court records to find out, okay, what were they actually charged with? What was their sentence? What's going on here? And with some court records, you can find them on Ancestry. Some court records you can find on Family Search. Um, some of them you can actually find through the different states. Like Indiana, you can find more recent ones um, through Odyssey, which is their database. Um, but you can also find on the Indiana State Archives, you can find for Marion County and a couple other counties you can find as well, not Allen. <laughs> I wish I could tell you Allen, but no. So you want to make sure to check all the resources. Now, I know some of you have been in my classes before, but I do like to show you really quick with Family Search and with Ancestry, it is sometimes better to search for your very specific location and the record set you're looking for. So if you go to the catalog and just say, type in Indiana, you can even go places within Indiana, so Allen County. And then if you scroll down, Okay, court records. There's eight hits. Maybe one of these has my ancestors' information in them. Now, this works for any state. It doesn't mean every state, every county has the same type of records, but searching that way, you can potentially find what you're looking for. Also, with ancestry, I have to go to this. If you go to the all categories. Down here, there's tax, criminal, land, and wills. They lump them all together. <laughs> but you can click on court and governmental and criminal records and actually very specifically be looking for things and see if there's something in one of these databases that is specific to your family. You can even narrow it down by state over here. Because sometimes you don't want to just be generally going through and 
just doing a search in Ancestry or in Family Search because it's searching everything, absolutely everything. You want to narrow it down to these very specific record sets to find the sources you're looking for. And make sure you look at different repositories. And by what I mean with that, well, I do happen to know that Mr. D.C. Stevenson's court papers, the whole trial, are at the Indiana Historical Society. So you want to make sure that you check and see if someone local doesn't have an entire collection about that person. And then look at his family history. What was going on? What were his parents doing? What were his siblings doing? What actually happened? Was there something in his life that made him turn into this person? Did something happen while he was in the military? Yes, he was in the military. So look at these different things and try to understand these people. Don't just automatically go, oh gosh, my ancestor was a criminal, I can't handle this, we're done. Learn why and how and just dig a little bit deeper. But remember, you are not your ancestors. What about divorce? That seems very commonplace now, doesn't it? There's some outrageous statistics out there saying how many people have been divorced, and it's really high. But for some people, it can be very shocking. Maybe their family were incredibly religious, and that went against everything they were taught growing up, and it's incredibly horrifying to them that their grandparent or great-grandparent were divorced, and they can't get over it. That could be a shock. Or maybe it's just shocking that there was a divorce back in the early 1800s that you never even thought about. In fact, this divorce that I have up here is from 1866 in Montana. 1866. So they had divorces back then. It was just a little bit different. So in, in some families, this could lead to people being disowned. Um, I actually... I do know in my family somebody was disowned because they were divorced so many times. It, didn't, it, it wasn't kosher in the large Catholic family. Hey, okay. I know her as the black sheep. That is literally what she was called. I didn't know her name until I found her while doing research. We all have people like that in our family, somebody different that doesn't fit the mold. That's okay. We're not our ancestors. So the fun thing is, and actually the hilarious part, so the black sheep in my family, I know I'm doing a personal story, I apologize, but her brother was also divorced, and I just thought it was hilarious that she was the black sheep, but he also got a divorce. I found his through newspaper. Nobody ever talked about it. Nobody ever talked about the fact that he was divorced. Literally was going through the newspaper just trying to find anything with the surname I didn't even do a search for the first and last name, just the surname, to see what was coming up in the area. And that popped up, and I was like, what's going on, guys? Hi, what's, what is this? So then that led me to do some more research and looked into it more, and it was a big old mess. But you can also look at court records, so court records like these. Now you can find these different types of records. You can look on Ancestry. You can look on Family Search. I will tell you that it is difficult to find divorces in a lot of different states. These are not records that are normally, I shouldn't say normally, in a lot of states they are not as accessible. So perhaps it is still considered to be a little bit taboo to be researching divorce, but that's okay. We're researchers. This is what we do. We dig, right? We find the things our family members wanted buried. We look for those skeletons. We rejoice with those skeletons. So, and make sure to look at your family history. What else was going on? What else was surrounding the circumstances? Was there letters that you've maybe seen that hinted to something? Or... Perhaps you do a little bit more digging and find out that 
um, your female relative who got divorced, maybe you find that her ex-spouse had a record for abuse. And you go, oh, okay, we're good. So do some more digging. Try to figure out why. Why did the divorce happen? Now, all the records aren't always going to be there, so you have to get creative. If you can't find the court records, use the newspapers. If you can't use the newspapers, start looking in the family. Try to figure out who the person was that they were married to. Look up them, research them, figure out where they were. Maybe the divorce didn't even happen in the state you thought it did. So make sure you keep looking and digging. But remember, you, exactly, you are not your ancestors. Okay, this is incredibly shocking for a lot of people. Um, I have seen some people very, very, very upset to find out that their family owned someone. And I completely understand that because it's not okay. But you are not your ancestors. You can still research it. You can still find out what was going on. You can still find out, okay, they lived that type of life. What were they doing? What was going on? Did they live maybe in Kentucky and then move up to Indiana? Where, where were they? Where, what was going on in their lives? And you can use these records to research. You can look at the probate and wills to see you can actually see people willed, slaves willed to another family member. You can look at court records, tax records, deed records. They would be deeded over. That's actually um, a sale of a slave up there. You can look at slave schedules and census records, newspapers. If there was a runaway, a lot of times there would be a newspaper article, um, an ad for the return. And different repositories as well. You can find a lot of different records on what was going on. And I gave you guys some different things that actually are here. So one of the things is we have the African American Gateway. Now, if you're looking at that, that's typically for African-American research. But you can also utilize it to try to figure out what your family was doing owning slaves. So you can go to the free databases and then the African-American Gateway. There it is. And click on a state. So let's say your family was living in Virginia at the time you can start going through and seeing, okay, what was going on? Are there any records? If you do a search, you can actually find some records. So there's an account of, it's at the bottom of the page, let me see if I can move it up. You see this right here, slaves owned by James Howard in Chesterfield County, Virginia. Okay, if that's somebody's ancestor, there you go, you have a record. You have information. Now, by researching it, it's okay to realize that A, you are not your ancestors, and B, by researching it, it doesn't make you a bad person. You're just looking up your family history. You are not your ancestors. It's the biggest thing that I have to keep reminding people when doing this sort of research. And then when you're also looking you might also take a look at one of our on-site databases. If you go to our on-site databases and then scroll down, we do have a database that's slavery and anti-slavery. So you might find some records in there as well. So there are resources for doing this sort of research. And this is just skimming the surface. If anybody has questions, we're always happy to help. But remember, you are not your ancestors. What if your family's not related? What if you do a DNA test and you're like, 
whoa, my great grandpa's not my great grandpa. What just happened? Who is my great grandpa? That's okay. It's a shock. You may need some time to actually take that one in, and I think everybody would understand. <laughs> but you can do the research. Now, with that sort of discovery, you're not going to have a lot of resources. You're not going to have the names. You're not going to have the people to start off with. So what you're going to want to do is take as many DNA tests as you can afford. Use GEDmatch if you're comfortable with using GEDmatch. And try to build up the family trees of the people who are closely related to you. So your closest matches when you're looking at your DNA results, that's who you want to research. That's who you want to build up their trees to figure out how they're related to you. Are they related to you because of someone you already know in your family? Or are they part of that missing link that you're trying to discover? So that's what you want to work on. Has anybody in here, a few of you are doing DNA research, right? Have you tried that yet? Researching other families that you're finding with your matches? It's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah but it's worthwhile. Once you find that little key and you're like, wait a second, this works, it's helpful. But ask for help. And I will tell you, one of my colleagues is a DNA expert. So I would highly recommend her, but we all here are willing to help and listen and try to get you to come up with new ideas. But remember, you are not your ancestors. What about mental illness? What happens when you find that in your family? Well, you do some research. <laughs> it's OK. So with this person, they were at the Toledo State Hospital for the insane. OK. Where, what's going on? That's obviously in Ohio. So let's take a look at some local collections. If I, honest to God, I just did a quick search for the Toledo State Hospital for the Insane, and this was the first result that came up. So already, I already have a collection that could potentially have information in here. And I got really excited. I was like, this is fantastic. There's some death certificates in here. There are some patient records in here. I was like, OK, this is a start. But in Further digging, they didn't have the actual patient records for the year that she would have been in there. Because if you look, so this is the 1940 census where she appears. OK, so need to do a little bit more searching. So if you look and keep searching and looking for records, OK, the Ohio History Connection, which is their historical society, also seems to have some records. And it looks like you have to do some digging, and you may have to prove that you are a relative, which is OK if you are doing this sort of research in the state. And a lot of places, these types of records are closed because they're medical records, so it's really hard to get your hands on them. So the fact that these even exist is amazing. So you want to do some searching. You want to look up the history of that hospital. Did it turn into something else? Because a lot of these different hospitals actually morphed into organizations that are currently still working with people. So maybe they have the records. Maybe it's a current organization that has the historic records. So you want to look. You want to look at the different repositories. You want to see where the information is going. Now, for some people, they could be put into a place like this because of a court order. So maybe you need to look up the court records. Um, you need to look up the history of mental health in that area. Why were people being put into these places? Could it be just because they were disobeying a spouse? Yes, at certain points in time, yes. So make sure to look up the history of mental health in that time period, in that place that you are searching, because it's different in different places. And then look up the family history. What else was going on? Where were her parents? 
Where were her siblings? What, what was going on? Was she married? No, it says single. Okay, did she get married? Because obviously found her tombstone and she died much later after this. So she died in 82. So you kind of have to keep researching and figuring out what other pieces of information can you get? But remember, you were not your ancestors. What about poverty? This is also interesting if you start thinking about in terms of, okay, different things in history happen where people were destitute. So you think about the Great Depression, you think about other times in America where money was short. You think about war times when money was short a lot of time. You think about when maybe soldiers didn't come home and there was a widow and children and no way to support them. So you have to think about the history of what's going on. Look at the history of the area. You also want to look at newspapers. Um, that little article that's up there is about a gentleman who went to the poor farm and come to find out he actually walked out on his wife and children 15 years earlier. And the sad part is, is when it comes to the bottom, it tells you that he actually passed away. And when they reached out to the family to see what they wanted to do with the body, they got no response. Probably because he walked out on them 15 years ago. But nobody had heard of him in 15 years. So that family would be very upset. Maybe this is something that they never talked about. Maybe they said he died when he walked out that 15 years ago. And this would be a revelation for somebody to find, this newspaper article. And the interesting thing is he, he walked out of his family in New York City, and he ended up in Newcastle, Indiana. So somebody doing research, and they knew their family was in New York City, this would be a complete shock to find him in Newcastle, Indiana. I'd be like, where is that? <laughs> So you have, to, you have to really dig sometimes and try to figure out what was going on. Now, sometimes you can find poor farm records. And I say, or any other name, it could be poor farm, poor house, whatever name it's going by. If there was some sort of help for somebody who was destitute or even homeless or anything and everything, look and see what sort of records exist. And look at their family history. Where was the rest of their family? Why weren't they going to their family for help? Were they around? What was going on? So you kind of want to take a step back and say, OK, let's just keep looking. But you are not your ancestors. And I think I'm almost perfectly on time. All right. Happy Halloween. Does anybody have any questions? I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this kind of light with a little bit of research talk. <laughs> the goal was to give you new ideas. Right. Thank you. Good.